Hello and welcome to the MIT Open Doc Lab talk. Today I'm pleased to introduce Fran Panetta and Halsey Bergen. Fran is a creative director at the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality. As an immersive journalist and artist, she pioneers uh, new forms of storytelling using emerging technologies that have social impact. Uh, previous to MIT, she worked at The Guardian for over a decade, um, where she pioneered new forms of journalism, including interactive features, location-based augmented reality, and led The Guardian's studio, the VR studio, um, while she was there. Her, uh, sorry, Halsey is a sound artist and technologist whose work focuses on the combination of modern technologies from mobile phones to artificial intelligence with fundamentally human technologies, primarily language, music, and the spoken voice. He's the creator of Roundware, the open source uh, contributory audio AR platform, which has been used to create art and educational ed installations for cultural organizations all over the world. He's also a fellow at the MIT Open Doc Lab. Today, they're gonna to talk to us about audio augmented reality in times of social distancing. Thank you, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us this afternoon or whatever time zone you're, you're actually in. It's kind of nice to be broadcasting over multiple time zones. Um, we do have a presentation that we're going to switch into momentarily, but I wanted to say hi in person and let Fran, uh, so we can, get a, we can get a view of, of Fran as well, to say hi, and then I will switch over to sharing my screen and we can hop into um, the audio AR discussion. Yeah, nice to be here and looking forward to, to chatting to you all after we've presented it as well. Yes, for sure. Okay, so let me do my proper Zoom screen share. Uh, okay. How are we doing? Are we good here? Yeah. All righty. So as, as Sarah said, our talk is called Audio Augmented Reality in Times of Social Distancing. And we're gonna uh, actually focus first on talking about what audio AR is, at least in our, our estimation, how we view audio AR. Then we're gonna leap into some project examples from both Fran and myself who have uh, long histories of doing this kind of work and talk about some tools as well. Um, and then we're gonna start talking about some collaborative projects of ours, including audioar.org, uh, which is a community of audio AR practitioners and Corona Diaries, which gets us back to our current state that we're all in and um, is our sort of attempt to um, morph and uh, change some of our practices for this present situation that we're all in. And then we were hoping to uh, lead into a discussion with uh, dis uh, a talk about um, some questions about what the future brings um, in the post-pandemic age, uh, whenever that whenever that does begin. I think we're all kind of waiting with bated breath as to when and how that will happen. And, and Fran and I have been doing quite a lot of thinking about how that affects our practice. And um, we're looking forward to uh, hearing from you guys as well with questions. So I um, thought we'd do a, a, a quick intro. Sarah, thank you for your wonderful <laughs> intros of both of us. But uh, essentially, um, we uh, found, found each other here at MIT after having shared, I think, a significant history over the past decade or so of doing audio ARR work. Fran, uh, from an artist and journalist perspective, as Sarah mentioned, and me from an artist, musician, and, and technology perspective. And we have. Um, it was wonderful to come across each other's work and to get to know each other. And as, as, as we have uh, continued to get to know each other better, we've been uh, working together, which has been really wonderful. And as I said, we'll be getting into some of those collaborative projects as the presentation continues. So um, without further ado, I will hand over to Fran. Oh, sorry, uh, Fran, do you wanna, did you want to take this slide or should I take no, this slide? Did. Okay, sorry, we're gonna have a little, little fumbling back and forth. We're in different, Time zones, different everything here. But um, so, what is audio AR? That's uh, that's a, a good question. Something that Fran and I have thought quite a lot about, and we've come up with this definition, which we feel is um, we're comfortable with right now. But it is a a, a medium which continues to change um, with technological advances and 
um, use case advances, et cetera. But um, audio AR, we feel elementally, is the overlaying of the physical world with a virtual layer of audio. So it enhances experiences that people have in the physical world with um, audio that doesn't exist in the physical world, but is is um, added through some kind of technology, typically a, a mobile phone at this point. Um, the three key points that we want to sort of emphasize are that the audio is connected to the physical world. Um, it's connected through your absolute location or somehow relative to where you are physically. There's some kind of interaction. The listener interacts with the audio by moving around a space or by, you know, turning your head or some kind of interaction. It's not simply a, 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 a speaker playing outside um, without any kind of interaction. And then, and then we're, what we mean by audio AR is uh, augmented reality that is really primary, primarily audio. That doesn't mean there's no visuals, but it does mean that um, audio is the primary, primary form of, of content. It's not simply um, audio that's supporting a, a VR experience or a, a visual AR experience. As important as that, that sort of audio is, in our definition, um, we're, we're, we're considering audio to be the primary uh, focus of um, of work that is considered audio AR to us. So uh, I will move on to the next slide and I'll hand over to Fran here. Um, and uh, yeah, take it away, Fran. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that kind of augmented audio reality has, um, people have been fiddling around and, and experimenting with it for quite a long time now. And it hasn't necessarily been labeled as XR or immersive um, and certainly both Halsey and I were making audio walks and they were immersive like we've been using binaural techniques for a, a very long time which are completely immersive and um, and and are extended reality as well and so um, I think that it's it's definitely part of this um, landscape without without having known it for quite a long time um, and there are definitely the, the kind of background that Halsey and I both come from a, a kind of sound backgrounds which aren't necessarily don't always intersect with um, the kind of gaming worlds or the um, or the visual aug augmented reality landscapes. But now with um, mixed reality headsets coming out and kind of increased interest in audio, we're seeing what used to be called kind of geolocated audio or locative audio um, being kind of um, welcomed in to this XR landscape, which is really nice because um, it is extremely immersive and it certainly does um, extend your conception of the realities around you of, of, of the world that you're in and um, audio as we know is has the capacity to be extremely immersive and so um, you know what um, what we what is it what seems to be a relatively kind of new term audio AR um, now kind of seems to fit very comfortably into the kind of MR XR um, spatial, spatial audio, spatial reality kind of landscape. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to just, um, I'm going to talk about one of my projects specifically, um, but I, I've been doing um, a range of um, location specific immersive audio projects for about um, 12 years now. Um, I come from um, I come from a music background originally classical music background and then radio and so um, also having an interest in in technology it became kind of really apparent as soon as smartphones kind of came out really with the first iPhone like wow this knows these phones know where you are and we can layer layer this audio in place and so um, the first piece that I made back in I am started around 2010 was um, was Hackney here. Um, now this quote here, actually this quote here pr pretty much summarizes why I love audio AR and why even now kind of 12 years later I'm still really excited about working in this area is um, really from the work of, of of Janet Cardiff and she she puts it really well here that 
um, audio perception changes our perception of the physical world um, and that as you manipulate the audio around you you can change our perception of reality and I really found this with some of her her works which I experienced as a wonderful piece um, here in London in Whitechapel and um, some great ones um, in the States as well, where by using very simple kind of binaural techniques and not even geo kind of tagging the material, she manages to change the way that you interact with your space. And for me, this is what I'm always trying to do in my work is to see if there's a way of, by layering the audio where you are, whether you can change your um, relationship with that place and that might be through um, its history, it might be through um, your emotional connection with it, um, with your understanding who's living around um, in, the, in the environment in that place around you. But somehow your way of interacting with the physical space around you will, will be changed by having this audio layered in. So I'm going to talk specifically about Hackney here, um, yeah, which was a piece I started in 2010 and um, launched 2011 or 2012, I think, around, around about the time of the London Olympics. Um, Hackney is the area um, which I'm in at the moment. At the time, I was, I was running a podcast of my own called the Hackney Podcast, and I'd been interviewing people uh, for the last kind of six years um, for my own kind of pet podcast. Um, this was... Um, a graffiti artist who um, took me on tours around Hackney um, describing all of the various um, different artists and uh, the tags and their, and their artwork. Um, so it kind of grew out of this project, which was getting to really know the kind of complexity of this area. Um, so this is where Hackney here, I located it. London Fields is, I am, this is exactly where I am now, not in the Lido, but on like the top right of this map. I've um, returned uh, during this period to be uh, back in London Fields. Um, so this is Hackney, which is a kind of Williamsburg-like area of London. It um, was traditionally quite poor in the East End and has had significant kind of gentrification over the last 20 years. Um, go to the next slide, Halsey. Um, so this is Broadway Market, which is at the bottom of that park that I just showed you. Um, it was a kind of old Victorian market that then um, kind of became um, obsolete. And then about in the kind of 1990s, they tried to kind of regenerate it as part of the kind of aims to kind of gentrify um, this area of London. They put a kind of slightly kind of boutique kind of market um, in place. This is, a, this is a Bob Cook's pie shop, which has been here for many generations. Um, in fact, he lives on the, on the floor above. He was born um, in the pie shop. If you go to the next, um, there he is, Bob Cook. Um, unfortunately, this, you know, this pie shop has now been closed for the last two months, so I don't know how, how he's doing at the moment. Um, if you go to the next slide. So this is, this is it, well, this was it about 10 years ago. Um, it's actually still quite busy. This has been one of the busiest bits of London that I've um, encountered over the last two months, uh, which is interesting. Um, it's not, it doesn't quite look like this at the moment. The market is closed um, during lockdown. Um, but yes, this is what it usually looks like on Saturdays with um, kind of overpriced organic apples and um, juices. And um, this is what sits around the corner um, from the market, which is social housing and, um, and projects. Um, yeah, if you keep going the other way. Sorry. <laughs> um, so this is also just around the corner from where we are. This was um, the scene of the London riots uh, in 2012. Um, so it's got a very mixed demographic community of, of people with very low incomes and then those with much higher incomes as well. This is um, Ridley Road Market, which is around a, a few a few streets across from Broadway Market, which is a very different kind of market. Um, if you keep going. This is Broadway Market again, some of the kind of posh cafes that have moved in. Um, keep going. 
So there you go. In the last 10 years, house prices have gone up 568%. The average uh, flat is 515,000 pounds, or at least was before um, the corona crisis. Now I'm sure that's very different. Um, and this is the park. This is London Fields. Um, so it's a kind of very beautiful old park. Used to be where they would um, drive um, cattle down to the market, to Spitalfields Market, and um, down into the East End markets. Um, it's Ian Sinclair, who um, is a local writer and historian who's um, written extensively about um, this area, and who was part of part of the project as well. And, and this is the site of um, the very kind of busy barbecues that happen. There are lots of signs in the park at the moment saying no picnics, no barbecues, no sitting down at all. So it doesn't quite look like this at the moment. So in terms of content, I got a, a grant from the Arts Council and the idea was to really try and give a sense of this area, past and present, um, the different demographics um, that are there. There are a hundred different languages spoken in Hackney, the borough of Hackney. Um, I, want, I commissioned uh, new music from local musicians, sound artists. I interviewed everyone from the locals who lived along Broadway Market to journalists who were documenting the changes, um, a couple of historians. I commissioned new poems. Um, and I also used archives, so bits of kind of Samuel Pepys and um, archive recordings. Um, I commissioned a short story um, and then I did lots and lots of binaural recordings. So I recorded um, the market being set up, being taken down, bikes whizzing past you in the, in the, in the um, park itself, football matches happening around you, the ping pong tables. Uh, people practicing plays in the park, all kinds of um, just kind of final recordings um, around around both the park and the market. Um, if you go to the next slide, and then um, then I constructed a kind of very multi-layered um, uh, tapestry for this project. So the first thing I did was lay down music layers. Um, so actually, they weren't they weren't squares; they were kind of overlapping circles but you can kind of get get the sense of what I was doing which was composing loops of music that would happen in different areas depending on what I thought the characteristics of those areas were and then on top of that if you go to the next slide Halsey I then layered on um, binaural field recordings which would sit um, um, on top of the music layers and then on top of that I had um, story layers. And so those stories could be anything from the, the poems, the interviews, um, the anecdotes. So what you had was this kind of very seamless um, interweaving of, of music and sound design and story, um, which kind of never, um, it never stopped. You kind of, um, if you walked out of a story layer, the story would pause and then you could walk back into it and it would, it would resume again. And then um, all of the other layers would kind of loop around you. Uh, what is next? Did I skip something or is that it? No, that's, that, I think that's right. Um, so yeah, this is, um, this is uh, what the kind of feedback that people gave us, like they felt like their body was, um, that the, the app and their body was like an instrument. It was like stopping and starting the recordings. Um, and that, that it was like this kind of fluid, fluid soundscapes that they were controlling. Um, do you want to go to the next one? Yeah, so this, this is just a quote. I felt like I was the push and pause button. Go to the next one. Is that, is that? Oh, uh, what happened to the recording? Wasn't there, was there not, um, we should. There, there was. Uh... <laughs> Here. There it is. <laughs> Do you want my to hear bad. It? <laughs> my bad, my bad. We got two minutes here. Sorry. Okay, so this is roughly what it sounded like. Okay, that's fine. Okay, yeah. Oh my god. Forgive my zoom. We are about to go on a journey. Sleep me in your pocket and prepare yourself. Are you ready? I'm 
Ian Sinclair. I'm a writer and I've lived in this area a long time. Now, if you walk with me a little way and then move over to the left where that bench is, we'll sit down and I'll tell you a little bit about what I feel about this place and what it means to me. Don't come around here thinking you can just come bop in on this park. Don't come to a man's park uninvited. That's like an invitation for hell. Pig throwing on London Fields, 1788. Secrets. Kissed a boy in the tower block. I think he was on the fourth floor when I was 13. If you're a gang member, get the guns in. Like, no small guns, big guns. In Hackney, if you're caught out with a 9mm, you're slipping. <laughs> I think it might have been my first kiss. You'll notice that, like the ship of Theseus, my parts have been replaced so many times. Wood, stone, metal. I'm not sure I'm the same bench as I was when I started. Follow me this way. <laughs> OK, stop. Wait. Close your eyes. Listen. The water's so inviting and the bubbles let the light in and the swimming is relaxing so nobody feels like fighting in the London fields. Lido. Then splish it up and splash it up, the hackney mix and mash it up, the tattoo and moustache it up, Lynn's in her bikini and Jonathan's in his speedos. Okay, there we go. That's um, some of the some of the sounds and stories that uh, that were woven through the piece. Thank you, Fran. Was there any was there anything else that you wanted to uh, uh, speak? Oh, about? Okay. Thank you. Great. Wow. Well, that was so great for me to um, hear and, and sort of be, it brings me back in time a little bit because um, the first time I heard about Fran's work, um, she uh, exposed me to uh, this project and a few other ones. And it was just, it's just so nice to, um, to experience them again and to uh, think about all, all that we've done since then and, uh, and how, how our work has been sort of over the past 10 to 12 years, been hitting on a lot of the same ideas, a lot of the same, um, thinking and thought processes, but also uh, also approaching um, approaching it from quite a different uh, perspective as well. So I will um, share a couple of projects of mine. Um, I think uh, it's, again, great to have uh, Fran sort of, uh, uh, you know, you guys be <clears throat> introduced to her work as well. And I can I can talk a little bit about mine and, and how they are, how, how my approach is slightly different. I think that probably the biggest difference is the fact that um, I do a lot of work with um, sort of active, real-time contributions. So I create these soundscapes much as Fran was explaining how she layers music and voices and all that. And I, I do a lot of that as well, as you will see. But I also allow for the sort of super nerve-wracking aspect of, of um, allowing people who are experiencing the projects to actually also um, uh, add their own commentary and uh, contribute to the soundscape over over time, and then the whole piece becomes more of a uh, of a uh, evolving uh, situation where it starts off on day one with maybe no voices, just music that I've composed for the particular region, and then over time it uh, it grows and grows. Hopefully, hopefully, if people participate, that's why one of the reasons why it's nerve wracking. But um, people can add their own comments and whatnot. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, go through a few examples of projects, a few different projects, and show a little bit about how uh, my approach to creating them and um, a couple of videos and audio things. And then we'll end up talking about uh, Roundware, which is the, uh, the system, the, uh, the, the platform which I've developed to, uh, to create these projects. So first I'll start us off with a video, hopefully. This is, um, I guess we'll keep with the UK thing here. This is quite a, quite a ways north of London. This is in, uh, in Newcastle, um, a project I did called Tributaries, which was um, a project that the museums uh, in, in Newcastle asked me to create a piece to um, memorialize the 100th year uh, anniversary of World War I. Um, Newcastle was, uh, 
you know, a, a shipyard and, and produced a lot of equipment and, and soldiers for the war effort. And there was obviously a lot of devastation, a lot of um, uh, challenges and uh, traumatic experiences for folks. But um, uh, given it's 100 years later, they were interested in doing a project that uh, kind of connected today with then. Obviously, the bridges, the architecture is much the same, but the social landscape and the people and all that is quite changed. So this was a project that kind of reached back into that past and tried to connect it to the present by allowing people today to add comments to um, to comments that were taken from uh, World War One. Obviously, they didn't have audio recording equipment back then, but they did have papers and pencils. So um, everything you will hear in this um, in this short video is material taken from archival sources and revoiced by um, either a uh, an actor, actress, or uh, in one case a a current day BBC weather forecaster who, who read the weather forecast for um, weather from 100 years ago. But let me play this video to give you a sense of what it was like. Oh, God, darn it. Okay, we're gonna try this again. Thursday the 10th of September 1914. There'll be some thick fog around this morning and that fog will really be quite dense. Just a very light west to southwesterly wind. My dear Nance, I now take great pleasure in writing a few lines, trusting that they find you in the best of health and that you are taking your tonic as to get nice and strong. I found places have a spirit, but it isn't the spirit of the Lord. In fact, at times it smells sulfurous. On the River Tyne, the weather is fine. Swing bridge, swinging for ships. Train bridge, doing great for the people. Tyne bridge, holding a party for seagulls. Steamer Luffworth of Newcastle, from the Tyne to London with a cargo of coals, was off Skinning Grove on Thursday afternoon when the sea broke on board. driving over the bridge, making it creak. I wonder what it would have been like here a hundred years ago. Lots of people around and lots of cars driving over the bridge, making it creak. I wonder what it would have been like here a hundred years ago. So um, you can see how there were, uh, well, you could hear perhaps how, how there were voices that were sort of that I actively put into the landscape, the weather reports, the, the letters that were read, et cetera. And then there was the ability for people in the present day to add their own comments, which were immediately available for somebody else to listen to uh, if, if they were in that same location. So in that case, on the bridge. Um, another project uh, that I worked on a couple of years ago was called From Here to Where, and I chose this one to share just because it was a little more, um, uh, it's a little more extended. This, this map actually shows a, a journey from Denver uh, in Colorado all the way out into, which is in the upper right, and then in the lower left is a location of a, of a, of a, a sort of art retreat exhibition that I was commissioned to do this piece for. And I decided to do a piece that would be uh, intended to be listened to while you're driving there. So the point of the exhibition was to discuss climate change and how we might want to be combating that a little more. And I decided to uh, basically create an audio journey that was listened to while you were driving along this path that would change from uh, sounds that were very much related to human interactions in the world and gradually uh, change more and more to natural sounds over the uh, course of this two hour journey. So we don't have two hours now for me to play this all for you. I'm not going to actually play any of this because I got to cruise through to another one. But um, much like the Tributaries project, this was accessed by an app. You just open it up, press play, and then drive. And as you drive, you would pass through these different regions. You can see there are different shapes here along the journey. Um, again, they're sort of delineated in colors in here, and each of these shapes had a different track of audio, and they would overlap 
And as you drove from one to the next, you would uh, fill, the audio would fade in and out depending on which, which section you were in. Um, and then these little, these blue pins uh, indicate sort of more momentary bits of audio that uh, they are accessed again in the circle around them while you, while you drive through. So there's underlying ambient audio and then voices on top that sort of filter in and out as you go. And, and then you arrive at your destination and, uh, and lots of other art projects were there. And the intention was to sort of prepare people emotionally perhaps for, um, for the experience that they were going to have in the middle of in the middle of this beautiful landscape in the foothills of the Rockies. <clears throat> so this next project I wanted to share a little more, get a little more into some of the details of how I produced it. Um, this one's called Bog People. It uh, takes place at a, uh, a cranberry farm or a former cranberry farm down in uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. And um, there was a project going on at this cranberry farm, which was trying to change the, or successfully, in fact, changing the, the, the cranberry farm from a uh, controlled, uh, you know, uh, controlled farming operation where there were fields and water was pumped in and pumped out based on what the cranberries needed, et cetera, et cetera, an agricultural situation to uh, back to a more natural situation. So it was a huge construction project to dig up channels and repurpose this whole area from uh, an agricultural one to a natural one. And the idea of this project was to sort of capture that process, talk to the people who were involved in it, and um, also uh, 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 provide some kind of um, audio uh, way of, of remembering, the, remembering the previous situation and looking forward to the future situation. So here's a map of this. You can see this whole area is the, um, is the cranberry bog. And what I did on top of this was I added areas, very specifically drawn areas of um, different pieces of a musical composition that I, that I wrote for this. And the idea here was to have two sorts of music. One sort of, sort of music was along the straighter paths, which are where the old channels on the Cranberry Bog were. If you can see, there's some paths that don't look very natural. They take these right angle bends, et cetera, et cetera. And that was used for agricultural purposes. And then have a different sort of music that would go along these sort of meandering paths, which were the new streams and the channels that were dug to return this, uh, this um, space to uh, this farm to a more natural uh, wildlife habitat. So uh, in addition to the, um, music. There was also a number of voices of people and uh, sounds of wildlife that I captured on site and um, you know, talking to the people driving the backhoes or the people designing where the new channels would go and all of that kind of thing and, and sort of uh, peppering them throughout the, uh, the landscape. You can see they're focused, uh, these voices are focused on the, um, on the pathways as that was a lot of um, where people were walking when they were experiencing the piece. So this is just a, a zoomed in version of the same thing. These ones were kind of fun because this was a lake that was created um, in during the process. And there was, I interviewed a guy in the middle of what is now a lake. It's kind of hard to get to that audio now, but it's uh, sort of fun to think about. It's there uh, regardless. Um, so I thought I would attempt to play a little bit of audio here, give you a sense of what this piece was like and I will Share some. And it's really important to understand what it was, what it did look like, and how it did function, so that we can try to get that functionality back, uh, even if it's not in the exact same plan. This water actually really wants to come when we take out this berm. This whole thing is a dam yeah. that we're walking across. When we take that out, this water will probably, as opposed to going through there, turn and go through here. I grew up in a, an area where our house was between two ravines in a forested area. And in the spring, it would, these ravines would run with flowing water. And I didn't really realize it until I had been doing this for a while that I just am doing exactly what I did when I was a kid. You know, I would build dams and rip them out. And um, I would mess around with the stream channel. And that was my, the highlight of my year as a kid, was when that water was flowing there. 
So today we went through and marked the um, channel moving downstream. Well, we're moving water. The idea is to dry out this side so they can cut the channel. Right. And, uh, right, yes. It's easier to cut when it's not filled with water, I suppose. Yes. They have to cut 175 feet a day. Oh, my gosh. So again, it's things like the historic sand layer that dry out the site that we need to address. It's the dikes that separate, the bogs that limit how wildlife move around and also affect how water moves around. Um, the limited channel reconstruction. So hopefully that gave a little idea of what it, what it could be like to wander around. Of course, as the creator of projects like this one, I have no idea how people are going to actually wander through the space. That's kind of the point, as Fran was saying. Um, uh, folks who experienced her projects thought of themselves as, you know, themselves and their app as an instrument. And I couldn't agree with that more. It's a, it's a, it's, it's definitely a goal of mine to have people sort of want to explore a physical landscape and want to, um, you know, understand more about the physical landscape and, and be, be encouraged by some of the audio that, um, that accompanies them as they, as they wander around. So, as a you know creator of this kind of work, it's um, you know when dealing with the real world, when dealing with real people, it's um, and have and giving them so much agency over their own experience, it's very hard to uh, to know you know what any any specific experience is going to be like. So it's really the sort of balancing game between how you think people will wander around, what what kinds of uh, experiences, what kinds of content you want to present to. Um, you know, the majority of people, et cetera, et cetera. And then just a lot of testing and a lot of hoping <laughs> and a lot of uh, kind of, uh, you know, just, uh, just uh, you know, uh, trying to give people the experience that you want and accepting that there are differences in everybody's experience, which are, which are part of the fun of, of, of creating a project, which isn't, um, you know, it isn't press play, in a standard piece of music and listen for a few minutes and then stop. It's a, it's a very uh, dynamic, changing thing. And then, of course, people can leave their own comments, which make it even more, uh, even more unknown what's going to happen. And that's that's kind of one of the one of the really fun and nerve wracking parts of this for me is I get to go back to places like this after they've been open for a while and and wander around and hear hear new comments that I didn't put in there that are now part of this landscape, part of this uh, this ecosystem in this case. So. Um, all right, so uh, now those are those were a couple of projects, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Roundware, which Sarah mentioned at the top, um, and I mentioned before as well, which is um, the platform that I developed to produce these pieces and and more. And uh, I I started building it 12 years ago, I think, in order to uh, sort of quote unquote solve an artistic problem, which nobody, uh, I couldn't find a, another solution to. So the idea of <clears throat> being able to tag the landscape with your own voice and being able to compose a piece of music and experience a piece of music um, in a spatial way instead of a purely temporal way was something that I was very interested in in my artistic practice. So um, I, tried a few sort of tools that could do little bits and pieces of this, but nothing really um, was built to the way that I, I wanted to, um, you know, that enabled me to create the pieces I wanted to create. So I started uh, talking to programmers and learning more coding myself and then uh, built uh, what is now uh, called Roundware. Um, the name Roundware comes from, from two places, which I think are illustrative of what the, what the purpose of, of the software is. Um, first, King Arthur's Round Table, which is you know, the idea that everybody at the table can speak their voice and can be heard, um, and there's no head of the table, foot of the table. So the idea that people can contribute to my works and other people can listen and decide whether they think those comments are interesting or not is, um, is a big part of what I do, rather than being a, you know, me being the single curator. Uh, nothing wrong with being a single curator by, at all. It's just not what I've chosen to do. And then the second round idea is the row, row, row your boat idea where you have multiple people sort of singing together, creating something together in an offset, sort of somewhat asynchronous pattern. And that is, again, what Roundware hopes to do, which is allow groups of people to come together and asynchronously uh, leave their own voices, leave their own experiences, leave all, you know, bits of themselves, if you will, in different 
physical locations and allow those to accrete over time and create something that is um, no doubt greater than the sum of, uh, of all the parts. So that is where Ramware came from. Uh, as, as it says here, Ramware is an open source project. It's on GitHub if you want to check that out. Um, contributory audio AR platform. There are clients for iOS and web, JavaScript. Um, we do have, we've dabbled in Android, but budgets are challenging. So um, web and iOS are the more developed clients at this point. As you probably surmised from the examples I've provided, there are two main features of Round where it allows you to listen. It has a, a mixing engine, which constantly updates um, where a person, a listener is located and, and with that new location information sort of calculates and mixes the audio um, in a different way. And much like as Fran was talking about the sort of continued continuity of the audio in her pieces, which is amazing, um, I, I aspire to that as well to create a sort of uh, continuous piece of music that um, it's not just a, a voice popping out of nowhere and then going away. It's much more about a sort of an ambient experience that, that immerses you and um, lets you listen and explore uh, in the physical world and the digital world sort of simultaneously. Um, and so the second function, second feature of course in Roundware is the ability to speak. It doesn't have to be speaking, it can be um, recording, making field recordings, uh, you know, birds, anything, you know, your, the sound of your feet walking, anything you want. Um, I do typically provide prompts for people to respond to such that they can maybe have some inspiration about what, what the topic of the piece that, I'm, uh, that I am uh, undertaking at the time. So that's Roundware. Like I said, uh, you can go on GitHub, check out uh, all the exciting code if you want, or roundware.org has information about uh, that project as well. So this brings us to audioar.org. As mentioned at the top, this is a uh, collaborative effort of Fran, myself, and a number of other people, and hopefully more folks in the future. It is a website that we are trying to get going. And um, the hope is that, uh, again, as Fran was talking about before, this uh, you know, audio AR has been sort of part of this um, you know, immersive XR landscape for, for decades and decades in its own sort of way, but um, with some new technologies and with new uh, you know, headsets and glasses and AR stuff like that, there, it, it does seem to be um, coming into its own a bit. And we wanted to sort of put out a shingle of, you know, hey, people who work in this area come and, and teach us what you do and, and share your projects and, and we'll share with you and we will Sort of come together and hopefully um, you know rising tide will, will raise all of us up so um, so yeah audioar.org uh, we have uh, articles in here um, on the blog there's interviews with folks um, some some more uh, industry related uh, items we do a lot of um, gathering of current projects of course projects are hard in the in the AR world because they're location based typically so you, you might not be where they are but nonetheless we're trying to sort of capture some of these projects and bring them together in one place along with resources which are tools and practitioners and all sorts of um, information that we can come up with uh, to um, again facilitate the creation of more of these types of projects that we're really hoping lots more people will get into and and really finding the folks who are doing it. I think there are folks sprinkled all throughout the world doing this kind of thing and we would like to um, bring them together. So that is audioar.org. Fran, yeah. yes. I think that's something that I've like having worked in VR and also in audio mm -hmm. AR I think that um, people who come from kind of radio or sound or music backgrounds can be quite self-sufficient because you don't need necessarily the, the really large teams with different skilled people that you do on something like VR. And so we can often be quite kind of, um, you know, self-sufficient is good because you can do things on smaller budgets and you can do things that, that often aren't possible um, with, um, you know, the more, more kind of larger, more complicated VR projects. But it does mean that, um, you know, when I was running the Guardian's VR studio, the, I was, you, you're Im immersed in the VR community very, very quickly. And, um, you know, I think the same within the kind of film versus the kind of radio world that um, it's, it's 
quite easy not to know of the other people who are doing similar projects, what other projects there are out there because, um, because, because it's not so necessary. And so one of the, one of the hopes with Audio AR um, was to kind of provide a space to bring together that community, um, which, which hadn't necessarily happened in the same way as for instance, the VR world. And, you know, anecdotally, I had talked to quite a lot of people who were interested in building sound walks and I would put them in touch with Halsey for roundware and I would say, these are the techniques I've used. But it felt a real shame that um, so many people were having to um, kind of struggle to, to kind of um, go through the hurdles that we, we've gone through and a lot of people have gone through um, just because there isn't the automatic community that, that comes from more complicated projects where you just have to to team up with more people. Um, and so I think really that was, was the primary aim was, was to kind of facilitate that and to provide a community as Halsey was saying, but also to be somewhere where people could look and go, oh, there are other projects. There are other people who are doing stuff like me. This is, this is how they're doing it um, in a way that, um, you know, it's just been, I think it's just been harder for this community. Yes, we are not all alone, right? We are. Yeah, exactly. We have lots of lots of friends out there that we can learn from. So, right. So, Corona Diaries, Fran. I'll hand back to you for for this. It is a collaboration, but I'll let you um, yeah, right. go over. We can get to the website as well. Just let me know where, where you want me to have. Okay, sure. So, yeah, this is another project that Halsey and I um, have been working on um, audioar.org, and we've also been working on a a deep fake AI project as well for the last year. And um, now this Corona Diaries project. Um, I was called by a couple of journalist friends um, round about kind of mid-March, early March, mid-March, um, who um, suggested um, kind of compiling a, 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 an audio platform where people could leave um, stories um, related to their experiences during the pandemic. And I immediately thought of Halsey and Roundware and Contributory Audio. Um, and so we kind of got together as a team of five of us, kind of artists, journalists, um, two you know, technologists as well, um, and decided that we would try and provide a space where people could contribute their own audio stories during this time. Um, and so we launched maybe a month or so ago um, with, um, with Halsey's um, you know, brilliant uh, hard work um, putting this site together. And um, I've already got, I don't know, about 100 or so, maybe more than that. Do you know how many? More, yeah, more, probably 130 or 40 now. Um, yeah. Recordings from around the world. Um, do we have some recordings we can listen to? Well, um, we have the montage that you put together. You yeah. want to listen to that? Yeah, maybe that. Let's listen to that. Uh, it's a tough question. What is troubling you right now? It's been a very, very difficult time for hairdressers. Am I scared? No mm -hmm. more than usual. I have a 90th birthday coming up, and I don't think that's going to be celebrated. We have the pressure of still having to pay our rent, not knowing when are we going to open and for how long this is going to take. What did you do today that's been different from the other days? making snow cakes instead of making mud pies. I am really happy that we have the snow because it's interesting. We've been doing the same things over and over again. I think I'm uh, kind of like finding my natural rhythm. Maybe being in solitude makes me realize who I am, how I cope with things, how I find pleasure in things, how I don't. And I think it comes down to just accepting that. Okay, bye. Um, so yeah, those are the, some of the kind of voices um, that we've been collecting so far. That was a, a little montage we put together for WGBH, I think it was, um, who wanted to feature some local stories specifically. Um, so this slide, I guess, is, is just talking a little bit about who the project's for. So um, we've been trying to trying to, as we've been um, building out this site, or as Halsey's mainly been building out this site <laughs> over the last month, uh, we've been trying to think um, who, 
who is this for and what are they using it for and what are the features they need so there's the kind of um the storytellers the public so i guess this project is entirely contributory um we are um we are very much um you know relying on people to upload their own stories to tell their own stories um rather than um to use traditional interviewing techniques that you know that i certainly that i would normally do um, then we've got our listeners um, who can go to the site and listen to, to the stories that are there um, but the thing that i really like about this project that i've certainly never done before with anything that i've done is is make all of the audio recordings available to anyone else to use so they could be musicians who want to weave these stories into their music to radio producers who want to do kind of you know straightforward um, news pieces documentary makers i mean anyone who is interested in using these recordings and we've got a kind of creative commons license that means that um, people are, are agreeing to leave these stories with um, under the under the knowledge that other people will take them and make creative projects from them um, and then archivists we're talking to a number of um, uh, archiving uh, organizations other universities that are interested in how we document um, this time maybe we should go to the site Halsey actually yeah sure um, good idea come back to this one but uh, we can take you to the site real quick. Ah, the way is how do I get my <laughs> Sorry, I'm not like my my Zoom. Uh, here we go. That, Great. Can we see that now? Is that good? Um, so okay. here we have um, Halsey's listen and and speak or listen and co contribute um, uh, features that he was talking about earlier. Um, some prompts to um, give you something to think about. Um, you can um, you can say where you are or choose a location, and then. Um, you make a, a recording we've given you up to two minutes to make a recording you can talk about anything you want something really exciting like what i'm talking about right now and then listen to it you can talk about anything you want something really exciting like what i'm talking about right now i'm not actually going to submit this recording because it's probably not good enough but uh, you get the idea upload and then it goes and it becomes okay. part of the map and just have a quick look on there See how the map is looking. So um, yeah, there's we've got um, you know a nice range of stories from um, around the place, and um, Halsey's also been building a, a kind of diary feature so that if we want to have people who want to give uh, regular recordings every day or however often they want, you can see. Um, you can see a profile and and listen to um listen to that person's stories as they evolve and we yeah we're looking at different ways of being able to um kind of filter and and listen to material and that's not only useful for people who are coming to the site who might want to listen to the latest recordings or all of the recordings from healthcare workers or uh, you know what, whatever the way we allow people to, to filter but also really useful to um, people who want to be using those recordings so if they want to have um, recordings all from a certain occupation or on a certain topic um, then um, hopefully that will allow them to, to, to do so um, should we jump back into the presentation? Yeah, so I guess from my point of view, I'm very interested in how one database of recordings can take different artistic forms if you just open that up um, and allow people to take um, those audio recordings and do whatever they want with them. So that will be interesting to see. We've already had um, a number of different news organizations use them in different ways. We had a podcast um, made out of the recordings. So, and we're just looking at um, a couple of other partnerships of people who either want to profile particular, um, uh, particular groups of people or particular geographic areas of people. So, um, yeah, we are learning as, as time goes on as well, how the site can be useful and what we should be um, providing as as tools yeah and there are obviously we're not the only um, people who are collecting in during this time there's lots of other uh, initiatives and we're trying to link up with some of those and 
um, see how we can help them and they can help us and uh, and kind of uh, you know work work together on a lot of this stuff because there's definitely a lot of you know when you have a, a global pandemic it does tend to uh, especially artistic creative types tend to you know come up with interesting projects to do um, based on the change of their situation so um, we love to hook up with <clears throat> other projects and uh, you know see where synergies exist. So um, moving on from this, it's um, as as Fran and I sort of talked about our projects. Obviously, one big aspect of our projects is you know this this connection between the the, the, the physical world and the digital uh, augmentation of that. In our case, audio and you know, existence in the physical world, like people being in the physical world. And of course, we are all still in the physical world right now during this, this, um, <clears throat> this time of the pandemic, but we are, of course, much more restricted in, in, in many, many ways as to how far we can travel, um, where we can go, what we need to watch out for, what, um, you know, what our lives are, are, are like, um, both physically and emotionally, of course. And that's gotten us to think a lot about sort of what, you know, what does a, what does, what, how does that change what we're doing and how will it change, you know, how will that change persist into the future after the pandemic is, is over? What kind of vestiges of that will, will continue? And, um, you know, we start thinking about a lot of these questions that um, I'm, I'm not going to say we have <laughs> clear answers for, but they're really interesting to think about, you know, what, what do we do when we can't wander in the real world? Obviously there's digital ways to quote unquote wander, I think Corona Diaries attempts to, you know, uh, do that to a certain extent by allowing you to, you know, click around on a map and kind of hear what somebody in a different part of the world is experiencing and perhaps make some kind of connection with them. Um, I think there are um, lots of interesting things about audio AR in the sense that there's this sort of asynchronicity of, of experience, you know, um, Fran can, you know, interview somebody and uh, leave a recording of that person's voice on a street corner, and then it's it's there when that person isn't there, um, and that person, you know, you can hear that person without worrying about catching <laughs> COVID nineteen from them. Um, and there is there's something about the sort of asynchronicity which which can be potentially perhaps useful about this form in a time like now. Um, is there a way that we can, um, you know, can we contribute to our friends and family spaces? From afar, can I make a recording and put it on a pathway that I know Fran is going to walk on tomorrow morning and leave a message for her? Are there ways that we can sort of interact through this medium that don't require, um, you know, us uh, doing the imprudent thing of, of you know, being physically with people, but still allow us to connect with with each other um, in in some way? And again, don't have all the answers by any stretch, but it is. It has provided us with, with, with an opportunity to think and rethink and reconsider and, um, and try and experiment with stuff much like what Corona Diaries is. So this has been a really, um, you know, busy as always with the homeschooling and everything else going on. But, you know, we try to, try to uh, keep the brain moving and uh, try to keep on thinking about what we can do next. So um, I... Uh, yeah, I, Fran, I'm sorry. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add about some of these uh, questions or whether we should go No, I'm to, uh, reading, I'm reading the questions from everyone else. Oh, I great. Oh, great. So you, you <laughs> excellent. Well, maybe this is the time, obviously this, this, I think this is the final question. How can our current restrictions expand the form? I think I kind of hit on that already. And um, I think there are lots of ideas, but we would love to open this up for, um, Mm -hmm. uh, questions from anybody and everybody and uh, thank you so much for um, joining us and uh, we just really appreciate the opportunity to, to share and please if you want go to coronadiaries.io and uh, you know, leave a, a more permanent uh, uh, recording for us to, uh, to include. Thank you. I, I put the wrong email address in there. <laughs> That's not my email address. Is <laughs> okay, Fran doesn't want you to contact her, apparently. <laughs> uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> just put it in the chat, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Wonderful. That I think fascinating. Don't, don't email Thank you. Me there. <laughs> Thank um, you, Sarah. Yes, wonderful presentation. We have a lot of questions for you. Uh, okay. Claudia, stop sharing. Lesson, uh, 
gallery view. We can first take some questions from our panelists. And I see William eager to ask a question. I sh yeah, I sure am eager. Well, first <laughs> of all, thank you. It's really, you're both of you do such wonderful work. And, and I, I, what I love about um, audio AR is both the intimacy, the intimacy of having something in your ears being spoken to, addressed in a really intimate way in public spaces, that juxtaposition is really striking. And the temporal juxtapositions, whether it's like stuff that's being folded in from the now, but having the then, and it's just a glorious space to, to wallow in and to explore through. But my, my question is, is findability. Um, so if it's an installation, if, if I know I'm driving from Denver to the arts installation and I have an invitation, and I know how to tune in, great. But I imagine the world is covered with this stuff and I, and I don't know how to find it. And, and what strategies or what ideas or what, what solutions are there to the, to the findability problem? It's, it's the curse of audio in a way. It's, it's hard to see and therefore in a visual world, very elusive. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, the curse of audio for sure. I mean, it's we are a visual, a visual species. It seems um, at least predominantly. Um, and this is clearly a very, very good question. I don't know if Fran has a definitive "I've solved it" answer. I do not, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, I've I have tended with my projects to try to link up with um, uh, organizations that have a presence in a more physical presence, whether that be a museum that. Um, that uh, can you know publicize and make known that such a piece exists, or or an organization, like an arts organization, that can publicize things through social media and whatnot. I mean, that's that's the sort of more um, you know social ways of, of of making things be known. I have experimented with technical ways of making things be known as well. Things like you know notifications on your phone when you enter an area where this kind of thing exists and. That's great if there was a, a more well-established platform that lots of projects could become a part of, then that would encourage people to sort of have that app on their phone and then it's like they can check it or it can buzz in their pocket, oh, new new project from Fran is available right where you are, that kind of thing would be, would be nice. Um, so I've experimented a little bit with that, but the, the challenge there, of course, is that without this kind of broad platform, you know, nobody's going to have a single app for... 25 50 100 different projects and if you've already installed the app you probably know where that project is so there's less of this kind of um, discoverability aspect to it so in my mind working towards something and i am working on developing roundware in this direction of being a platform where people can have a single roundware app and then it can transform itself based on what project you want to engage with and that could have notifications that's a big it's a big lift there's a long way to go but i think as you know I don't know if Magic Leap is going to turn into anything, but as a lot of these these companies, you know, with lots of money, uh, uh, sort of get their wares out there and things become more known <clears throat> and to the general public, that that, that will help as well. Um, so yeah, Fran, I don't know if you have other thoughts along those lines. Yeah, I think there's a kind of short term and long term answer to that. The short term is, you know, is a bit like Halsey was saying, it's kind of partnering up with festivals, with institutions that have infrastructures that can promote the pieces that can give out technology if necessary. And that's the kind of short term solution, which I think we've all used and, and VR uses as well. You know, it's, it's, it's still, hard to be getting anyone to be doing immersive um, experiences outside um, kind of which don't exist within the ecosystem of festivals, large media organizations, large museums, large galleries. So it makes sense to kind of partner up with those. Um, I think the longer term in, um, solution is, is unfortunately that we, we are, we have to wait till the big tech companies embrace audio AR and facilitate that for us. And I think that they will, like, I think that, you know, we saw a little bit of that with Bose, um, you know, a couple of years ago, which has been a, a little bit of a kind of a false start in a way, but my guess is that the other kind of the Googles and the Apples are thinking about how audio can be useful on location and it's going to be, as, as good as all of our efforts can be to try and publicize the work we're doing it won't be until people are really consuming audio on location 
for very functional things and it's and it's built into these tech platforms that people actually use this on mass that's my guess great we have a question um, from the audience uh, dana Danswell uh, says i'm curious about asking the user for audio submissions at a specific location what percentage of the participants added audio during user testing, how comfortable were they? How mandatory and how strong is the call to action for audio? Yeah, this is something we've been considering and had a lot of feedback about people being either comfortable or uncomfortable. And um, at the moment, you can change your location and there's also a kind of bit of geo wobble that is put in. So it's not really specific because we're aware that people might not want to be saying exactly where they're in lockdown um you know we're all kind of bound to our homes at the moment so um that's certainly been something we've got a lot of feedback from we haven't built the, the capability yet not to put any location on but that is on our list of of things to be developing and, and i think as far as just sort of generally contributing um to a project uh Obviously, there's well, maybe it's not obvious, but uh, uh, there's a lot more people who tend to listen to, um, uh, in my case, to my projects and experience them that way than who choose to contribute. Um, I try to make things as um, I try to encourage and I try to make it as as a low barrier to entry as possible to make the recording. Um, with Corona Diaries, we spent tons of time trying to make um, the platform available on you know all browsers on all platforms, both mobile and desktop, and that's that's a big technical lift. And um, we've gotten most of the way there, but 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 facilitating it technically is one big thing. But then there's also this sort of emotional uh, facilitation, which which is that it it takes some. You know, not everybody's comfortable necessarily. They might have something they really want to share, but they might feel like it's not the right thing, or they might not know what to share, but they want to share. And then things like what prompts do we have are really important. Like what, what are we asking folks to contribute? Or do we have a, a general open bucket for kind of saying anything? Or do we have very specific questions that give people some inspiration? Those are both tactics that we tend to take. Um, I usually take, you know, both of those simultaneously. Um, and, and then also, I think there's a lot of sort of precedent setting in terms of what, when people are listening to audio, if all the audio that we put in there on day one is hyper produced, you know, radio documentary style audio, then probably some person sitting at home with their kids screaming in the background is probably going to feel like, ah, I can't, I can't, uh, this isn't what, they don't want what I have to offer. And so we try very, very hard to, to never say we don't want what you have to offer. We want exactly what you have to offer. And there are examples of all sorts of recordings of all sorts of different sound qualities and different um, types of, of uh, you know, commentary very off the cuff versus more well thought out ahead of time. And, um, you know, we try to set that precedent so that we encourage people to, uh, to jump in. So hopefully that addresses the question. Great, so another question from Matt McVeigh. Can you describe some of the unique qualities for an audience of experiencing an audio story as an immersive embodied narrative where they listen to audio while walking through a place? So some of the techniques we, we use when making the pieces or some of the unique qualities when listening, sorry. I think it's for the audience when they experience these audio stories as an immersive embodied narrative. I mean, I think that what it, a little bit like I was saying with the Janet Cardiff quote, for me, what it does is it changes your relationship to the, the place around you. So and I think it's quite, I always use the example actually, not of the stories particularly, but of, of the recordings that if you walk through, let's say a completely empty street, but you hear it full and bustling like a market, suddenly your experience of that place is very different. You feel it's like it's had this life, you know, maybe it was yesterday, maybe it was a week ago, that is not there around you. And you look at it, you, you, you feel that place very differently. And that's also the case with stories that, you know, I, I played in Hackney here a little clip of um, he was um, an ex gang member of one of the who lived in one of the housing states just on the side of of that um, of that uh, of of the park and he talks about the middle of that the 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 middle of that park being the crossroads and so while you're standing right in the middle of that he says you know this is the crossroads it's here 
where three different gangs intersect and and this is you know this is right in the middle and and you know he points out where the different gangs are on that part now for most people who are having their picnics and um you know doing their barbecues they don't they they might not be experiencing the park like that but when you layer this other sense of reality on it suddenly you think this is this is a very different place than my reality of it was before so it changes your relationship with that environment and even if it's a new environment you haven't been to before what you're looking at around you by what you're hearing is changed from what that immediate perception is of where you are and 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 so for me that is always what i come down to is like what are the different techniques as producers and artists and composers that are going to change the way that we are interacting with that space yeah and i'll, I'll add really i agree, agree with all of that and 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 in addition i think just thinking about audio instead of visuals from an ar perspective um you know i think ben and i both feel very strongly that one of the amazing benefits of audio is um, not only does it sort of emanate from all around you, um, not just the way, way you're looking, but also it doesn't um, distract you from your physical environment the way a lot of visual AR overlays can. Um, not only can it distract you such that you, you know, wander out into the street chasing a, a Pokemon or something, or, but also it's, it's just this, this notion of being able to be fully present in the space by you know, connecting to it with your eyes and your other senses, of course, as well, and then having the audio be, um, you know, augmented too uh, is is really powerful. Um, we think for you know, storytelling and, and experience creating. Great. We have a question from Farid Ahmed. Uh, what is the difference between video AR and audio AR in terms of audience interaction? If I've done a user test, I've got no stats. William, you might have more stats than we do on the different, no, okay, uptake on it. I mean, we can talk anecdotally about the difference, a bit like Halsey was saying, in terms of like what we as practitioners, what we feel the difference is as an experience, as either, you know, both makers and as consumers. Um, I would go back to exactly what Halsey was saying, is that audio AR, for me, brings you a deeper engagement because you're really visually and you know your 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 visuals your sense of smell your everything your the, the you know the the wind everything is very heightened because you are engaged in this space in a way that you're not necessarily if you're pointing your phone around as a magic window or like it's it's you are you're trying to in in a sense intensify an engagement with the physical space and with all of your other senses rather than distract you and for me that's the primary difference as a maker from 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 visual ar yeah i don't have too much to add to that i think it's it is um it's also you know of course what what the uptake is is largely based on what the big companies are pushing as well and and as we've been saying before it's you know this ar has been generally thought of as a visual thing you know apple talks about their new you know ar kit and everything and they show you videos of people you know playing virtual ping pong on some table or something like that and that's obviously there is an audio component to that but it's not not a very significant one so i think that um a lot of the reason that people i mean a lot of a lot of the sort of uptake is going to be dictated by that but we hope that um that audio experiences sort of audio only or audio first experiences um Harkening back to our definition of audio AR will be uh, become more prominent and, and easily accessible, um, you know, by these tech companies. People are liking audio now as well. Like when we were started making these, like audio wasn't trendy. Now that it is, so we're yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> podcasts have helped us, right? Podcasts yeah. and just the, the idea of of getting content through your ears instead of your eyes is like way more popular. I had to now. listen now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. And maybe just to chime in on this point um, with the historical reference. <clears throat> In my uh, German media class, the, the students just read Rudolf Arnheim's 1935 essay on television. Arnheim was a perceptual psychologist, and he talks about this as radio television, as radio plus a tube that you can see through, a sort of visual ancillary to the radio. But he really goes deep into 
the, the perceptual psychology of audio, which is that it is, you know, given the limit of hearing from the point of view of the microphone, it's really accurate. Like what you're hearing is pretty much what you hear. Whereas every visual form we have is pretty inadequate, whether it's VR or AR or film or television, there are huge inadequacies in the image relative to the, to the kind of adequacy of sound recording technology. And that's a huge, that's a huge difference. I think that that speaks to exactly what you were saying. Oh, thank you. That's very, interesting. very interesting. Yes. All right. So we have a question from Elena Kaufman who seems to want to collaborate. She says, if you had access to a physical experiential space, do you have people in the community um, who would be interested in trying things in the space, even at a distance? I have a space opening sometime in September, and I'm happy to provide this space as an experimental space for audio AR. We are based in Egypt. Wow, the great. That's thank you so much for being here and for um, for sharing that. That's uh, we are always very very open to um new collaborative ideas and um you know i know for you know my the very nature of my work sort of requiring it, uh, people to contribute is sort of means that i don't have any good ideas of my own i just i just take them from other people while i go so collaborations are great um and we would love to um uh, uh you know discuss more with you we can certainly um don't email the email that fran put up there but we have real emails that we uh <laughs> that we will that we can use um and generally speaking, I mean, spaces for audio experiences are, are really great. Um, I think, um, you know, Audio AR has sort of, there's the location-based aspect of Audio AR, which Fran and I have mainly focused on, as you've seen, we're, we're, we're sort of overlaying a, a, a map, so to speak, with, with um, audio based on where you're located. But there's also the notion, of course, direct, of directional audio and how audio, you know, when you spin around in one place, how, how you have these sound objects that feel persistently located in, in this uh, digital space. And a lot of times um, spaces maybe such as yours uh, with, with surround uh, systems of, of audio are, are able to really dive into that spatial audio realm, which is something that I think is coming together with the location-based stuff. I'm doing experiments with that in Roundware and whatnot, but it's, um, that's another sort of really, really powerful arena. It's, I, I'm probably going on a tangent a little bit, but um, Elena, if I'm getting that word, uh, your name right, um, we would love to hear more and discuss more. All right, someone's curious about the music for Corona Diaries, Karen Michael, why that choice? Uh, that piece was by Kev Hopper, who's a friend, and uh, we, um, we needed to put something together for, um, for a montage for WGBH, and it felt, uh, I, I think it's got some character to it. Like, I, when I was putting that together, I didn't want it to feel like really melancholy or really upbeat. Uh, he's, a, he's a sore player. Um, Kev and um, it's just got you know it's just got some character to it so so don't don't mistake a saw for a theremin right that would be yeah bad. yeah <laughs> yes or um, Stefania Cassini are the Corona Diaries only in English no no there yeah. are there are other there are recordings definitely in German uh, what other languages are in there there are I feel like you might have a Spanish one yeah. as well um, <laughs> The site is certainly, obviously the site is, um, you know, the, the copy and whatnot is English at this point. We would love to make it um, as, you know, fully localized as possible. Um, as with everything on, you know, low minimal budget, um, we have to prioritize stuff. But we, right now, there's nothing preventing anybody from making recordings in any language they're comfortable with. And we, we love having all of them for sure. Uh, another question. Uh, do you have some editorial supervision over the material uploaded by the audiences? How do you deal with avoiding content that might not be suitable for the project? Yeah, so at the moment, um, I mean, we've, Halsey's just put in this kind of flagging um, capability where members of the public can flag content they want us to look at and consider for moderation. So that's what's built in so far. We've not been overwhelmed yet that we can't do it in this way um if it got to that case to that you know to that stage we'd need to consider what other things we needed to put in but at the moment that's the moderation process yeah it's a very it's a very good question there are a lot of technical approaches that can be taken right now we use what's called post moderation in the sense that we 
can moderate things after they've already been sort of put into the system. We, we do feel that we don't want, we want people to immediately be able to see that they've been added. We want to give the impression and the, the, the truthful impression, in fact, that we trust people to be respectful and add their own commentary. And we don't want to have people feel like they're making a recording and sort of tossing it over a 30 foot high wall and hoping that the authorities on the other side deem it appropriate enough to include. We much prefer to say, hey, we're open, we're going to include it. And of course, we reserve the right to take it out if it is inappropriate on some dimension that we deem problematic. Uh, you know, is it an advertisement for somebody? Is it, it doesn't even contain bad language that we think is not, you know, not purely illustrative of their situation, perhaps. So we haven't had any problem. We haven't had to take anything out yet. So, you know, we're feeling pretty good about this project, but I've had certainly problems in the past where, where there are recordings that, um, that I need to take out and, and it's, it's not that hard to keep up with that, but it's a very important question. When I do projects with larger institutions, they tend to care more. If I'm working with the Smithsonian, for example, they worry more about a swear word being in there than I do as, a, as an individual artist. And that's understandable, but there are ways of managing that. Great question from Nado. Hey there. So first of all, I mean, it's so amazing to see all of your <laughs> audio AR work kind of smushed together in one presentation. You know, I've heard of bits and pieces throughout the, but uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, but also uh, specifically uh, the question about editorial supervision connected for me with William's uh, first question, just thinking about it's kind of weird, right? Having those uh, venues or whatever we call them systems for hosting audio AR experiences that are maybe a little bit parallel to the way cultural institutions kind of like a little bit wall themselves off from kind of the main street or the main plaza where things are happening. Um, and, you know, if you think about where people upload constantly, right, material, right, the kind of like speak part, right? We talked about how more people, people listen than do the speaking part, but, you know, there's a ton of that obviously on like, you know, YouTube, whatever, Instagram live, right? All of those things. TikTok. TikTok, right? So like th there's no short, I mean, it's, it's those platforms don't have a problem getting people to upload stuff, but it's not necessarily stuff that um, uh, would come up in, in this kind of platform. So I'm just curious about this kind of weird, right? Equivalency or non-equivalency, like between real space, real kind of, uh, public spaces versus cultural institutions and then the kind of those specialized platforms for AR versus more generalized kind of, you know, social media based platforms. If you're seeing any ways to bridge between those two or you think it's good that there's that kind of separation. I'm not sure. I, if mean, I don't think it's good. I just think it's inevitable at the moment. Like I just, you know, I'm somebody who worked in podcasts for like a really long time and it just took a while for the technology to be mainstream enough for everyone to be able to download them, to stream them, to, you know, before it was similar, it was kind of, they were walled off to a certain extent by ex, you know, by broadcasters mainly. Um, and it's only now that it's become much more democratic for people to be able to make them and access them. And my feeling is it's a time thing. Like we, it'll take time for the technology to be embraced by the big, big tech giants. And, and, you know, I guess it's chicken and egg. What do they want to, what do they want to focus on? Where do they want to put their money? Um, but I think that it's, it, it, it seems like there is interest for them to engage. And I think that then you will see the transfer across. But I think this this differentiation that we have at the moment is just an, a necessity because, you know, as we were saying, just to get audiences, to get people knowing about, you know, for marketing reasons, for technical distribution, it's just been necessary so far. And ideally that wouldn't be the case, but I don't think we're there yet. And, and you know, that's one of the reasons we made audioar.org audio was because there's no there's no reference place to know like what audio AR pieces are even out there at the moment to be able to go and consume. Where do you find them? What what projects were there in the past? What's currently available? So um, it, it's just been it's it's quite hard to even know um, what to, what you can listen to. Yeah, there are there are 
I mean, things have definitely shifted over the time that um, we have been working on this stuff. I mean, but the first the first project I did with Round were actually called Round, uh, and uh, it was it was basically a sort of subversion of the audio tour for a museum. Um, and the idea was that all the commentary that you would hear when standing in front of a particular work of art would be sort of, you know, essentially crowdsourced. And it would be people looking at that work of art standing where you are standing at that moment as a listener. And they were making observations about, about the works of art. And when I did that project, which was, I guess, maybe 12 years ago, it was, the, I mean, even the notion of, of talking in a museum was still like, Verboten. People were like, oh my God, you have to, the, the museum people were like, are people going to be willing to talk while they're in the museum? And, you know, I don't know. I mean, my experience now is that that is not no, anywhere near as much of a big deal or, or a concern to people sort of from a, a social acceptance uh, standpoint. So in that sense, you know, things are sort of slowly moving towards this point where, um, you know, not only is it okay to talk, but, but but it's weird if there is a, a system that doesn't allow you to talk back to it. You know, it's like, you know, th this, you know, the, the, the days of the Met audio tours with Felipe Montebello sort of booming down from on high telling you what you should be thinking about a, a work of art are, are, are no longer, they no longer seem to be quite as accepted um, as, as, you know, as an okay way to go about the consumption of art or really of, of culture in general. So, Nadav, I'm not sure if we've uh, fully answered the question. It's a, it's a good one, um, and it merits a lot of a lot of thought there. But surely, the, the you know, if if TikTok came to us and said, "Hey, can we integrate audio AR into our platform and uh, encourage all of our bajillion users to um, to do this kind of thing?" I'm sure we'd you know try to think about something that might work there because it's got it's got to be a collaboration. You know, two two artists <laughs> can't. Uh, can't create these massive systems that uh, that are in some ways needed to shift um, some of the cultural perceptions. Great, okay, we have time for about one more question. This one's from Paul Roque. I'm intrigued by the idea of using asynchronous AR listening to have people feel close together in the same space while social distancing. Any thoughts on the role of binaural audio specifically in creating a sense of togetherness and shared space? Oh, that's a nice idea. Uh, I don't know. It's it's funny because when I'm when I'm watching um, pieces on TV that were like news pieces or whatever that were recorded before social distancing, like, it freaks me out a bit at the moment. I'm like, oh, no, no, move away from each other. You're far too near. Um, so I wonder if I had people babbling really near me, whether that would freak me out at the moment. Um, it's worth testing, isn't it? Whether it's comforting or... Uh, yeah, whether it gives you a feeling of community, this, you know, you can have these wonderful whispered voices in your ears or whether that just feels far too near. Um, yeah, it'd be worth, it would be worth experimenting with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the binaural really does create a sense of, of, of space um, with, with the audio and including voices in that sense of space, maybe not too, maybe not too close, like you said, Fran, it might, uh, it is weird how quickly perceptions change along that regard, but, um, I, yeah, I definitely think it is, it is this, yeah, the asynchronicity is, is certainly something that, that should be experimented with and could, could provide, you know, I mean, I'd love to walk into my living room and have a, 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 a an audio message from my mom or something who's just knows that when I walk into my living room next, she'll, well, she's not technical, so she probably wouldn't do this, but, you know, a, a family or a friend, then, uh, who would uh, be able to kind of, you know, lob, you know, sort of throw an audio, sort of throw an audio recording from, from their life into my life or their space into my space and kind of have it, have it sort of, you know, exist there and be discoverable in sort of random ways. Um, it could be a lot of fun to that. And um, it might be something that, uh, that we're forced into a little bit more in our, in our current situation. I was thinking of remaking that, you know, because I'm right next to the same park from from the project I was talking about. I was think, re thinking of re-sound designing it and experimenting, you know, with these kind of very thick layers of not necessarily of people talking, but of activities just to see how that felt. So mm. maybe maybe you'll spur me to and um, to actually give that a go and see what it feels like. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for that.
Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation. There are a lot more questions, so I encourage people to email Halsey and Fran directly, uh, or they can answer them afterwards. And thank you, everyone, for being here. We'll see you next week at the same time. Um, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.